So as many of you probably are aware, Hydrogenics has been exhibiting at Hanover Messe for how many years now? Uh, since 2001. So quite some uh, time. So 18 years. I've been here 16 times. You've been here 16 times. Yeah. So you've been around here. Many of you probably are, know Mark personally, uh, but there are a lot of new faces this year and a lot of new exhibitors. Do you want to maybe give a little bit of an introduction to Hydrogenics, uh, where you're based, and what it is that you guys yeah. do? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're a uh, fuel cell and electrolyzer manufacturer. Uh, the electrolysis business goes back 70 years to a Canadian company called uh, the Electrolyzer Corporation. Uh, which uh, we brought into the hydrogenics uh, company uh, in 2005. Um, the hydrogenics uh, name was uh, in, uh, was founded in 1995 and to develop uh, fuel cells. We got into the test station business uh, either accidentally, but we were the fastest growing company in Canada over a five-year period and filled the labs of all the major uh, fuel cell developers uh, worldwide. Um, we developed uh, PEM electrolysis, and that's what uh, got us uh, very strongly into the uh, high, uh, high-powered uh, uh, electrolysis uh, systems. Uh, headquarters is in Toronto, uh, actually Mississauga, where the uh, Toronto International Airport is. Our electrolyzer factory is in uh, in Belgium near Antwerp, and uh, where I'm working in Germany, uh, we have a service sales uh, and engineering uh, support center. Uh, near near Dusseldorf. Okay. So let's talk about um, the Generation 3 fuel cell module. What What is it and what yeah, does it do? Thank you. Yeah, so Generation 3 doesn't sound like it's very old, but uh, it's uh, we've had uh, the first generation was uh, brought onto the market in 2002. Uh, it was a, every fuel cell we did before that was obsolete before it was even finished. But when we uh, came up with our low pressure, uh, low profile uh, design, uh, we realized this is something that we could actually put on the market uh, with a warranty and a manual and uh, tested that for a year and never looked back. Uh, so we've expanded the product line, uh, countless variants to pretty well every uh, imaginal, imaginable application that you could think of. Uh, and the, the the second generation came in 2011 when we combined the balance of plant, which was external. So all the components were connected by tubes, pipes, uh, hose, wires um, outside. But to save space and make it more robust, we integrated everything possible right inside the end plate. So it's looking more like a bare stack, but it, 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 it's a full complete engine. Um, the, the third generation now is, uh, in fact, you don't optically don't notice a lot of difference uh, from the outside, but th we felt because of all the uh, things we put in and more uh, robustness and intelligence, we have a new fuel cell management uh, in, in the control systems with uh, really impressive um, uh, it, it diagnostics. Um, uh, systems that uh, it, it qualifies for a, for a third generation, and we we first uh, uh, communicated it uh, a couple of weeks ago at the uh, Fuel Cell Expo in in Tokyo. Oh, and so what what really differentiates it is that this is the size component. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, what else we announced uh, and what's new to the product is a new size. In the past, uh, we had uh, in a single uh, stack. Uh, 30 kilowatt module, which fits a lot of uh, applications, um, and we build those up to uh, fulfill higher powered units, even to uh, into, into the multi megawatts. Um, the 50 kilowatt module is is new; that uh, it's the same architecture, and it's a third generation as well. Um, it allows us to do even higher power uh, with fewer fuel cells. What does that mean in terms of market applications? Because of the, the larger size and scale, um, does it allow you to enter into new markets that were previously like, unavailable to you? Uh, it's not bringing us into new markets. We've been able to serve every, every uh, market that's, that, are, that approaches us that makes sense. Um, what it does, though, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, to do 50 kilowatts right now, we need uh, either yeah, two, two of the 30 kilowatt fuel cells. So it's larger 
and takes up more space than uh, it would be if it's a single. The other example is for stationary. We have a 19-inch rack, and with the 30 kilowatt modules, it's 120 kilowatts in a single rack. Going to 50, that's going to be 200 kilowatts in, in a single rack. So, okay, in terms of um, your projects, though, I know you are based in Germany. You do a lot of stuff internationally. I know that from working in the space and being around here as well, that there's been a lot of developments um, in some of these applications, one of them being the train train industry. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what has happened and shifted in, in that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, actually this third generation fits with that theme in, uh, very well because a lot of the new uh, improvements uh, and things, features we brought into the uh, third generation is coming from uh, a lot of things we learned on the, on the train development. Uh, so robustness, shock, vibration, um, uh, winter protection and so on and uh, the train um, is we're used to talking in our industry about projects and this was a real community uh, commercialization uh, that was announced in uh, 2014 that uh, Alstom's going ahead to um, bring fuel cells into regional passenger trains and uh, there was a public, uh, not public, uh, by invitation uh, tender competition and uh, we were awarded the, uh, uh, the deal. And uh, we have an order for 100 trains, that's 200 uh, fuel cell systems, uh, but there will be likely uh, a lot more than that from what, uh, what we can see from the, from the market. Uh, originally it was 60 trains, or sorry, 40 trains, um, uh, with uh, letter, letters of intent from four German states. That was later increased to, uh, to 60. Uh, and the first two uh, received the type approval. So after a year and a half of, of testing and getting the certification with the uh, Eisenbahn Bundesamt, um, received the uh, type approval, which means it's for, it's, uh, for series produ production. It's not an individual approval. So type approval in the rail sector means it's really meeting all the requirements uh, for the application. Uh, so from that, we can actually say it's, uh, if you know the NASA technical readiness level um, uh, measure, it's uh, technical readiness level eight. Technical readiness level nine means it's fully mature. So that's what is now happening with the two trains that are in operation in northern, northern Germany. And if you can go right now <laughs> to ride one of the trains, uh, so they're operating every day. Um, yeah. When do you anticipate the, the next 100 to be in operation? Because right now you're in the process of the, you got the commercial order. When are they going to be fully operational? Yep. Do you yeah. know? Yeah, um, it's going to be in the next couple of years because uh, the, uh, just because there's an LOI doesn't mean it's a firm order. And uh, there has to be, uh, in trains, there has to be public tenders and that takes time. Uh, so Alstom is, is getting the firm orders, uh, and they are, uh, when they have the, the, the critical mass of orders, they will give us the go-ahead to start the series production. Oh, that's really cool. That's been a, like a big project that's been going on for a while, and that's seen tremendous growth, growth over the years. Well, the, the growth we're seeing are new trains that we didn't even know about before. Um, Alstom, when the other countries uh, saw what's happening in Germany, uh, they said, wow, we want the same thing. And so the UK, um, there's a rail uh, operator called Eversholt Rail. They have a project called Breeze. If you check on the internet, you can see uh, videos of the what the train will look like. Uh, and that one, instead of uh, 400 kilowatts per train, it's 600 kilowatts per train. And in this case, it, it's going to be retrofits. Uh, so that means old, even older trains can be converted from diesel to Fuel, hydrogen fuel cell. Oh, so there's a huge shift in the transportation industry now here, which is great. Um, what about in terms of your electrolyzers? I know that that's another area that you're really focused in. I know there's a lot of projects going on there. Can you speak of some of the most recent um, projects that have been announced? Yeah. yeah, so about half of our company and revenue is on the electrolyzer side. The, uh, where our main business is, though not here, it's not renewable and transportation, it's industrial. Uh, so that's the 70-year-old uh, business that we have. And uh, the, we, de we were developing the large-scale PEM because in 2008 there were some analyses done for the Energiewende that 
um, large-scale electrolysis is going to be the solution uh, to enable harnessing the full uh, power uh, production capability of the uh, renewable assets, um, allowing to balance the grid and store energy for uh, not just minutes and hours, but for weeks, months, and seasons. Um, and uh, we, yeah, you just have to see, uh, freedom thought we, so the most recent uh, project we have now um, is a industrial application for a 20 megawatt PAM electrolyzer. So this is showing that it's a, uh, a plant of air liquides in Quebec um, an SMR plant, so steam methane reforming, where they're producing uh, hydrogen for uh, the industry there. So it might be refineries or uh, um, uh, steel plants or whatever needs hydrogen. And they're, instead of doing it by just adding more natural gas uh, uh, conversion equipment, they've gone to uh, hydrogen generators from, uh, from electrolysis, from green energy, uh, hydroelectric power. Which is a huge cha change because it comes from, it shifts away from individual orders of like one-off one to now the production area. So it means a huge shift in the industrial applications as well. And that now we're starting to see more of like green production facilities as opposed to those run on, f on fuel, fossil mm -hmm. fuels. Yeah, and this, uh, this project with the 20 megawatts uh, with Air Key, that's showing that they don't need uh, fossil fuel anymore to produce hydrogen. Uh, so that's really, uh, that's really significant. And with that, they can also, they're making lots of hydrogen that they can offer to, uh, for vehicle fueling as well. Yeah. I'm going to open this up to the floor for some questions. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for Mark regarding hydrogenics um, and any of the products that are currently available or any uh, of the projects? Are there any questions? Oh. Okay, um, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for joining me. If you guys have any questions, I do encourage you to go visit booth E59 in the corner just to our left. Um, for the remainder of today and tomorrow, uh, Mark will be very happy. He's been very busy all day. There's been numerous people at the booth, but I'm sure you can catch a couple moments with him. Thank you so much for your time, and I really enjoy talking to you today. Yeah, thanks very much, Roxanne. If you do come by, we do have a one megawatt electrolyzer model that you can see full scale, and also uh, a third generation uh, fuel cell power module. Thanks.